The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. All right, so let's get started. So last time we were talking, we talked about factorization in the effective theory. And there was one type of factorization, which was this hard collinear factorization that happened when the Wilson cof, which is a factorization between sort of the low energy physics described by the operator and the Wilson coefficients. And we decided we wanted to think about that in the following way as having convolutions between variables that appear in the Wilson coefficients and variables that appear in the operator. And the way that we can think about that is just what the most general possible thing is that we can write down for the Wilson coefficients. And of course, it can depend on large momenta. And so large momenta here includes the label operator. So large momenta always show up in the Wilson, in Wilson coefficients. And in this case, that includes momenta that are the large component, the lambda, order lambda 0 component of collinear fields. So this is hard collinear factorization. And it just comes out in a kind of natural standard way in this effective theory because we've set up the effective theory to have the right low energy degrees of freedom. So even though it's a little more complicated than just a simple product, we see sort of what the variables are that can connect the two things. Uh, just by power counting, essentially, that the large momenta are the ones that are order lambda to zero. We can kind of do this generically if we recall the definition of our Wilson line. You can see how this would carry over to a generic case in the following way. So that was one way of defining the Wilson line. And as an operator, we have relations as well. So we had this relation. And in particular, we could take this to any power. And that just takes the p bar to any power like that. So you can really think of this as given any function of this operator i m bar dot d, you can always write that as a Wilson line, a function of p bar, and a Wilson line. And what you want to do is you want to stick these Wilson lines in the operator, and you want to put this function in the Wilson coefficient. So you could think, let me start with operators where I just I can throw in i and bar dot d's because these guys are order lambda 0. These are the linear derivatives. I'm just allowed to stick as many of those as I like in my operator. But given that I put in any function of them, I could always do this. And, and it, the right way of thinking about it is that this, should, this, is, this function here is, what you're, is determined by matching. It's your Wilson coefficient. And that's what we were effectively doing up here. But this is, in some sense, a more general discussion. You can see that even if you had multiple places in the operator where you could insert these derivatives, then you would just do this. And what would happen is, at the end of the day, you get a function of all the possible large momenta that you can form from the operator. So maybe one more line. So think of it that you can always separate out you can always separate out that make a split like we did over there with the integral over some variable and then leave something that you can stick in your operator. <laughs> <laughs> 
make it like this. So this could go in the operator, and then that's the coefficient. Well, here I didn't write it. So if I wanted to put in im bar dot d's, I'd stick them between, right? If I wanted to have used the formula, if I wanted to use this kind of logic, I wouldn't have written this. And I would have said, said let me stick an arbitrary function of im bar dot d in here. But between, uh, sorry, before you even write It has to be between them because of the gauge invariance. Right, so before you even write down the Wilson line, so say you start to say, okay. Oh, I yeah, so there's still, right, this Wilson line here, Right, right, right. This Wilson line here came from this H. So that's still going to be true. And what I'm saying, if you think about this operator, right, I could dress it up by putting any function of im bar dot d's right in here. Because that would still be a order one, same order and gauge invariant. I mean, this is an alternative. But then if I use this, right, then if I use this formula, it would sort of push this w that would cancel there, and then this w comes back, and then you get the f. OK. So in general, the, the right way of thinking about this is as follows. We can encode this in some notation. By just setting up a convenient set of building blocks which are gauge invariant objects under the linear gauge transformations. And so we need to have a fermion field, but we know that the fermion field generically we can make it gauge invariant by multiplying by a Wilson line like that. And because of this, what we were just discussing here, generically we can be, in our Wilson coefficients, sensitive to the momentum of this object. And so we can do that, denote that by defining the following thing. Which is just a chi field that carries some momentum, which is the overall large momentum of this product of fields. And sometimes this guy goes by the name of the quark jet field, because it's kind of the object, if you were to produce a quark in the hard scattering process, the quark would be represented in your operator by this W dagger C. The Wilson coefficients would talk to that quark through the large momentum, and that quark in the low energy theory would evolve into a jet. So it goes by that name. You could also think of it as a parton field, because as it turns out, and as we'll talk about later on, if you were to think about the parton distribution function and what pulls a quark out of the proton, it's exactly this operator. And then that quark's momentum, what momentum that quark uh, carries, is exactly picked out by this delta function as well. So these are the objects we'll actually usually want to work in terms of. We can do something similar for the gluon, which is a curly B. And I'm going to define it. If we wanted to get a gluon, the natural thing is to use a field strength, because then you get a gluon without any derivatives. But I want my ob ob object to be dimension 1. So I'm going to define it in the following way. So here's a field strength, commutator of covariant derivatives. These are collinear derivatives. And I throw Wilson lines around it to make it gauge invariant. And then to make it dimension 1, I throw in a 1 over p bar. And if you start expanding this out, And the first term will be the an perp gluon. And so you, this b just has the an perp gluon in the same way that the first kind of order term in this chi is just the, the fermion if I set the Wilson line to 1. OK, so it's starting out as a perpendicular gluon. But it's dressed up in a way that makes it gauge invariant in dimension 1. <laughs> 
And then just like we did here, we can put a subscript on it with a omega to give it to say that we fixed the large momentum of it. And sometimes there's a convention that that's done. You have to decide if you want a, the Wilson line, I mean the delta function to be a w minus p bar, w minus p bar dagger. And anyway, it doesn't really matter that much, but it's just a sign because it's just a sign of what you mean by a w. If it's an outgoing gluon, this is a more convenient convention. Okay, and so this delta function here and this p bar here, when I put these square brackets, what I mean by that is that they don't, they don't act outside, they just act on the operators inside. So, these are objects that exist by themselves and they don't care about other things that are multiplying them later. So that's the gluon analog of the quark. So it turns out that we can show the following, that if you want to build operators that are subleting order, a complete set of things to do that is as follows. It's this chi n, the b n perp, and then you could also need p perps. And then you could also have ultrasoft fields where it's really kind of similar to how you're used to building operators in effective field theories. But if you just want to talk about the clinear sector, the only things you need are this chi and this bn field and then p perps and no other things. That's just one order? All orders. So why aren't there any? I'll talk about it. <laughs> yeah, we'll show you. I'll show you. Okay. Yeah. I mean, intuitively, you would think these are the physical degrees of freedom, right? There's two of them, so that's intuitive, but I'll show you how you get rid of all the other ones. So it kind of matches up with what you want. You could think that, you know, these are the physical gluons that you're producing and your operators can be set up so that they only depend, that there's not so, sort of any spurious components. Okay, so we'll get there. Uh, so let me do, a, let me introduce a bit of notation. I have to do So let's consider this thing, a covariant derivative sandwiched with Wilson lines on either side. And this IDN here is like P bar plus So it just involves the collinear gluon field. So then if I have that operator and I just take N bar IDN, then that's P bar. If I take I DN perp mu, then you can show that this guy is P perp mu plus G B N perp mu. So this one is just a relation we talked about before. This one is not as obvious, but if you take this guy, you can either let the derivative, you can let this derivative P perp act on the Wilson line or act through. If it acts through, that's this term. If it acts on, then I can manipulate the operator so that it is exactly of this form. And part of that comes from the fact that I can ex explain it to you here. I have it in my notes and you can look at it later, but let me just explain it in words. If you looked at the term in this commutator that was the other order, where the im bar dot d was, acting up, was sitting here, then it would hit the Wilson line and get zero. So that term was just put in to make it look like a gauge field, I mean a covariant, to make it look like a field strength. Uh, Okay, so, so really you have im bar dot d, dn perp without the, without the comma, without the brackets. But then this combination here, uh, this combination here is just, you can use the identity that we had with the, and basically you're, you're, if you push this guy through here, you're canceling the p bar. So it's just giving you the Wilson line. So that's basically how you go from here to here. Okay, so this is by way of arguing that I don't really need 
if I'm considering p, this is basically the, what this is saying is I don't need to consider covariant derivatives because I can instead consider p perps and b perps, and that's equally good. Okay. Now, if you do th a similar type of thing in the n component, then you can derive a similar type of object. So this is the same object as we have over here, but instead of having an i d n perp, I'd have an n dot d. So d n perp replaced to n dot d. And that looks like it could be something that you build operators out of. So why not, and, and also furthermore, why not have operators that depend on this end up partial, okay? So for p bar, we don't have to worry about that. So okay, we have, you know, I said we'll include this, we'll include that. We're di I didn't say we'll include this, this, and this. So there's three things I have to argue away here. The derivatives that are p bars, those just go into the Wilson coefficient. So if we had like p bar chi n comma, Omega, for example, and that's omega chi n comma of omega, and this is in the put into the Wilson coefficient. So that's why we don't have to worry about having p bars. In some sense, we do have p bars; they're all in the Wilson coefficients. So it's really these other two that we have to worry more about, and those actually can be simplified using the equation of motion. So if you have i and dot p on I end up partial on chi n, then the equation of motion, when you write it out in terms of these objects, it has some form. And basically, you can just get rid of those terms. So equation of motion allows us to get rid of I end up partials that are on chi n's. So that's why we don't have to worry about those. And this is just like saying that in our leading order action, in our leading order action, there was an I end up partial. But, and that's just like saying there was time derivatives in our leading order action in some standard effective field theory. But then in the, low, in the higher dimension operators, you can always use the equations of motion to get rid of those time derivatives. And here we're using the equations of motion to get rid of I end up partial. So it appears in the leading order action, but then we don't have to have it in any other subleading operator, and that's why it's not one of the ones that's included in the list. And if you had I end up partial on curly B, that's also a part of the equations of motion of the gluon field. Now when you do the gluon equations of motion, there's components, because it's a vector. And one of the other components allows you to get rid of the end up, end up B. So there's another term that you can rearrange and I won't write it out because the equation is rather messy, but give you some idea. There's another component that looks like this, where I can get rid of all the n dot curly b's using the gluon equation. So I, the gluon equation of the motions allows me to get rid of both of these things. And then I just have the, th and basically after I've done that, I just have the objects that I've told you we can use. So after using equations of motion, we can get down to those objects. And any other thing that you might dream up can be reduced to these objects. So I'm not saying that I went through a complete list here. For example, what if you had a commutator of two dn perps, right? You might say, oh, that's some new thing. It's not, it's one of these, you can also reduce that too. some idea that there's others you might think of dreaming up. <laughs> <laughs> 
can reduce all of this to this set. Okay, so for the collinear sector, this is enough for higher to build higher dimension operators, just these three. And then for the ultrasoft sector, so I guess this is two. We do need ultrasoft collinear deriv uh, ultrasoft derivatives. Ultrasoft field strengths. And ultrasoft quarks. So this part is really just similar to the story that you'd have for a standard low energy effective field theory, like integrating out a massive particle. You can use the equation of motion. Um, one thing that is worth commenting about is the connection between one and two. So one is collinear and two is ultrasoft. And a priori you might think, well, just they're totally independent. But we saw last time that reparameterization invariance connects them. So if I've decided that this is the type of basis I want to use for my operators, then what is the reparameterization connection? You can rewrite what we said last time in terms of these curly d's, because it basically just means moving the Wilson lines that we had in this formula last time. They were around the ultrasoft operator last time. And if I just move them over to the collinear operator, then I get this curly D. Right? So the RPI connection is connecting the curly D to the D ultrasoft, curly D collinear to the D ultrasoft. And then you can write this guy as the P perp plus the B perp. Okay, so that's, and likewise, if you do the same for the N bar sector. You move the Wilson lines from this term to that term, then it looks like these two combinations. So that's just rewriting what we had before, but now in terms of these, this type of notation. OK, so that's enough to build operators at higher order. And then we write down Wilson coefficients for those operators that are functions of the large momentum, and then we start doing physics with them. So any questions about that? Yeah. You always just use the leading order equation of motion yeah. in the higher order term. Yeah, these are the L0 equation of motion. That's what I'm doing here, I'm writing here. Yeah, there's one more actually. There's three that it's only needed at some very high order. But. OK, so the next thing I want to talk about before we start doing explicit examples and going through processes, is how loops work in this effective theory. And we're going to have to come back and talk about our grid that we had for this split up of momenta and how should we actually think about it in practice. And then we'll also deal with how matching and running work. So I'm going to do this in the context of an example. And again, I'm just going to pick the simplest example that has only one jet, just to make our lives a little bit simpler. So we'll consider our heavy to light current. And I think, actually, once you see how it works in this example, you'll understand what all the, all the general features are of doing loops in SET. So we had operators that we constructed, lowest order operator. And let me write it in this way, which was prior to making our field redefinition. Just write it this way if I want. And gamma for B to S gamma is a tensor operator. And there's the photon field, which is a field strength F mu. So let's just think of that as all part of gamma. 
Okay, and then that's also appearing here, and I could use the spin structure properties of these things to reduce the sigma mu nu, but that's not really going to be part of our story, so let's not bother with that. So what do I do? I just compute the QCD loops and the SCT loops, and I compare them. And if SCT is the right effective theory for this limit where I have an energetic photon and a back-to-back -back with an energetic so strange quark, then I should match all the infrared divergences in that QCD computation. I should be able to extract a matching coefficient. I should be able to determine this, what the C is from that calculation. And I should be able to run the operator. I should be able to make this into MS bar, do some renormalization of this operator, and then do some renormalization group evolution of that of Wilson coefficient. Well, let's just think about computing the graphs. So we have to decide when we compute the graphs how to regulate them. Right? We're gonna, and we need to use the same infrared regulator in the full theory and the effective theory. So here's how I'm going to regulate them. We could do this different ways, and it's useful to understand that various answers that we get are independent of the regulator. So I'm going to take p squared not equal to 0 for the strange quark. So there's infrared divergences associated with the strange quark, and I'm going to take p squared not equal to 0 for them. I'm going to use dim reg for the heavy quark. So I could take the b quark to also be off shell. That would make the formulas even more complicated. So instead of doing that, I'm just going to allow epsilon to regulate the b quark. And these guys are pretty easy to track, so that won't uh, be a problem. And I'm going to use Feynman gauge. I don't have to do that, but that's a nice gauge for doing ca calculations. So what are the diagrams? Well, I have my photon, and I have a vertex diagram like this. And then I have wave function renormalization. And so let me, in the usual kind of cavalier way, denote the wave function renormalization, which is just the multiplication by the appropriate z factors by diagrams like that. And this is a standard QCD calculation, and we can carry it out. And what does the answer look like? So the, this diagram here has double logs. and single logs that involve p squared, which is our IR regulator. And then it has some terms that are finite, which I'll just denote by. So p here is the momentum of our strange quark going out. And pb is the momentum of our b quark coming in. And let me not try to, we're not going to talk much about these finite terms, but there is some. terms with, what I mean by finite here is terms with no IR divergences. The IR divergences are these single logs and double logs, and then there's some, some remainder that I can write that way. I'm expanding for small p squared. So p squared is not equal to 0, but I take the limit p squared goes to 0. And in that limit, these are the IR singularities. And then there's some function of p dot p dot b, which is just an order 1 thing. And then b squared, of course, is pb squared. So that's sort of the remaining kinematic variables this could possibly depend on. No. It's really finite. There's no, so, yeah. Um, yeah, so I, let's see. I, uh, yeah, I guess I carried out the, so there is a z tent for the tensor. And it, when I write this, uh, yeah, let's see. 
So, okay. Let me do this. <laughs> I think it's better. So I added up all these graphs, and I want to add one more. Just to, so there's a, there's a counter term for the tensor field. So let me, add up, let me change what I was going to say and do it this way. So the sum of these four graphs is this. Okay. So then if there's no UV divergences. And I'll just tell you what the Z factors for these three are, and then you can figure out what this graph is by subtracting the two. <laughs> So the tensor current in QCD has a, has a Z factor. It looks like that. There's a Z for, for the heavy quark. And if I include the finite residue as well as the divergent pieces, This looks like this. I think I'm going to have to make one adjustment to my formula here. So if I want it to be the way I say, then what do I have to do? So this guy should be 3 halves. And there will be one more divergence. I think that's right. So this 2 over epsilon ir here is that 1 over epsilon ir. And the UV renormalization is taken care of once I have the Z tensor that there's Z, there's divergences in this diagram and these ones, but there's one left over and that's taken care of by Z tensor, so there's no one over epsilon UVs after I, after I take care of this guy. Okay, so that's just kind of by the definition of what Z tensor should be. And then everything else is as I wrote. So there's IR divergences that are associated to the strange quark off shellness. That's these two terms. There's an IR divergence associated to the heavy quark going on shell. That's that term. That's the sum of diagrams. OK, so what about SCT? So there's going to be in SCT collinear diagrams and ultra soft diagrams. So I'm going to use Feynman gauge for everything again. This is not something I have to do. But this is what I'm going to do. So let's start with the ultra soft loops. So there's a vertex graph. So using the notation that we've adopted, where the collinear quarks are dashed and the heavy quarks are double lines. We have a diagram that looks like that. There's some prefactor. Let's focus on what the loop integral looks like. So this loop here, the k that's going through this loop, is just a residual k. There's no label k for this loop because it's an ultra soft gluon. So when we write down all the terms in this loop, it's just standard field theory. There's nothing special about it. Since I'm taking the strange quark off shell, the propagator that I get is this shifted iconal propagator, where the, basically the fact that it's off shell gives me this 
extra term there. That's regulating some IR divergences. And we want that because we want to regulate the IR divergences in the same th way in the full theory and the effective theory. This is proportional to that. And if I put in all the factors, It does have lo double logs of the p squared. It doesn't have single logs of the p squared. And actually, if we look at the double logs, the coefficients also don't match with what we had over there. And so there's going to be some other diagrams that are going to involve double logs of p squared as well. One thing that we can note here is that if you think about the scales in the problem, remember that our loop integral was totally homogeneous in the power counting. The lambdas were totally homogeneous. And if you think about p squared as scaling like lambda squared, which is natural size for an external collinear momentum, right? If p squared scales like lambda squared, then so does p squared over m bar dot p. And this is a dimension one thing, and this is the ultra soft scale, right? momentum. And so if you want to look at these logarithms and you ask what scale is this effective field theory diagram sensitive to, it's sensitive to the ultra soft scale. So the logs are not large logs. They're order one logs as long as mu squared, mu is of order lambda squared, which is the scale for, the, for ultra soft momentum. And that's what we expect from this ultra soft diagram, that it's telling us about physics at the ultra soft scale. And that's what we see I'm setting things up, doing the calculation. So you could also think about a wave function diagram with an ultra soft gluon. But this guy's 0, since in Feynman gauge, you just get n mu n mu, which is 0. So there's no, so z for the linear quark field from an ultra soft loop is zero. That wouldn't necessarily be true in some other gauge, in some, but in some other gauge, this diagram would also change. All the diagrams would change. And so if there was a non-zero contribution in this diagram, it would just be taking care of gauge invariance. And then finally, there's ultra soft loop on the heavy quark. And that actually just gives us, that's an HQT diagram has nothing to do with the clinic quark. And so from that diagram, we would just get the z factor, which is the appropriate z factor in HQET with R regulator. If I specify ultraviolet and infrared divergences, that's this. And this infrared divergence here is actually exactly the same as the one that we had over here. OK, so the ultra soft sector is really just, there's nothing really tricky about it. It's just write down the diagrams, do the loops. Sorry, but the electricity gate, isn't that like a IR divergences of those diagrams cancel with, a, with the real emission, with the evidence of, for the emission of a real one? Um, it depends. So what are we looking at, right? So it depends on what we're looking at, at here. And what I'm doing. So yes, in general, that would be true, right? If you were calculating some cross-section, which was IR finite cross-section, and you, that, of course, would depend on defining what you mean by measuring this quark, right? So the IR divergence would become some physical scale, like you know, the mass of the jet, or the, some, some, the, something, the IR divergences would turn into something physical, right, if you put this into a physical cross-section. Um, and that's exactly basically what would happen. These p squares would become sort of the mx squares that we talked about when we talked about beta gamma. 
Uh, but here, what we're interested in doing is a matching calculation. So we fix the external states to have a particular number of partons, and we want to compare the full theory calculation with the effective theory. The effective theory should reproduce the infrared divergences. Uh, so really, all we care about is not that this is infrared finite, but rather that it's got the right that the effective theory has the same infrared divergences. And we'll see that in the end, what you can think about is rather than canceling infrared divergences as you're thinking in the full theory, we've matched the full theory onto the effective theory. And that matching gives us the Wilson coefficient. And then we take the effective theory and all the cancellations that you're thinking about between real and virtual graphs will occur in the effective theory too. So you can just think about the effective theory virtual and real graphs and then the cancellation will take place there. But that, then you're thinking about that cancellation later at a lower scale, which is what you actually want to do because what I just was telling you about IR divergences becoming different things in the, effective, in the final state becomes very trivial once you're in the effective theory. And we'll see sort of exactly how that works later on. But first, we have to talk about linear graphs. So in the linear graphs, we had graphs like this one where we could take a gluon out of the, out of the vertex here. And that corresponds to taking it out of the Wilson line. So let's label the graph in the following way. This will be k plus p. This will be p. This will be k. And if we follow our rules for what this is, we would write a sum over labels. and then an integral over residuals. And let me put the residual integral in dimensional regularization. Let me try to squeeze in everything. <laughs> Which won't be possible, but. So I'm going to write out the components to make clear who's residual and who's label. So in the denominator, there's one more term. So the plus guys are always residual, and the perp and the minuses are always label. It's a short way of saying what I'm trying to squeeze in here. Okay, so the denominator has these three terms, this guy here, this guy here, and this guy here. Oops. And when I label the diagram like this, you should think that each of these has a label and residual part. So k, you can think of as a pair, k label, k residual for now. And remember the importance of doing this. The importance of doing this was related to always being able to identify what the lowest order term was on the right here. Okay, and that actually becomes more important once you start to think about diagrams where you would add like an extra ultrasoft gluon somewhere in this picture. Then it's then of course when that ultrasoft gluon feeds its way through this loop, you've got to make sure that it's only the lowest order piece that's showing up. In this case here, it's really just we just have a collinear loop. And we don't have any sort of uh, real ultrasoft momenta from ultrasoft particles besides the heavy quark, okay? which is just an external particle to the loop. So what we want to do with this is we want to turn it back into an integral. And if it wasn't for these restrictions here, then that's very easy, actually. So I claim, and then I'll talk about why it's true, I claim that if we ignored the restrictions, and those restrictions are ensuring that we don't double count, <laughs> 
between our collinear and our ultrasoft degrees of freedom. So they are important, but let's ignore them for a minute. If we do ignore them, we would just get the following. where I just basically stop thinking about residuals and labels, write everything as a full momentum, and write down exactly the same thing I just wrote. So this is a full k squared, and this is a full k plus p squared. OK? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to first ignore these, label, these restrictions. And then I'm going to tell you how it would work, how like, this actually does turn into this. What are the rules for doing that? And then I'll come back and I'll tell you what, what these extra conditions do. So really, in order to see, so this, is, this looks like maybe it's trivial, but we should think about it. And uh, it's almost trivial, but not quite. So really what we're doing here is we're combining back together labels and residual momentum, right? And the place that we have to worry about that is in the perp and the minus space. And recall we had the grid, and the grid is sort of our way of gui our guiding, our guidance to sort of see how to put things back together. So we had vectors that lived in this space, and you know this is the label, and then there's the residual if we want to point to some place in that space. This picture was like a Wilsonian effect of field theory, because the picture makes you think of sharp edges. But the real effect of theory that we're doing is a continuum one. And so you have to expand your brain a little bit and think that each of the boxes in this picture is actually an infinite space as well because the residual space doesn't have restrictions like that that would spoil Lorentz symmetry. So each grid point really is specifying an infinite space of residual momenta. And it's R4, I mean, or it's Minkowski space. So the momenta components are real numbers. And there's some rules. So what are the rules? So I'll tell you what the rules are without restrictions for now. And then we'll come back and I'll tell you what the rules are with restrictions. So rule number one is the simplest. And it just says that say I had a, the following. And I'll use kind of a one-dimensional notation. Say I had a sum over KLs and an integral over all, all KRs. Well, that's just the same as not having split it up and doing an integral over everything. Because we split this thing into boxes. And if we really integrate over all boxes and, and uh, sum over all labels, then we should just get back the full integration over all the momenta. So that's true for each for minus and per momenta. But really what we have to do is we have to do this with some integrand, right? So the type of integrand that we have is as following. If you think about the components, if you think about the components that we're talking about here, which are the minus and perp ones, then there's, in our integrand up there, there's no minus or perp residuals. So it's just a function of the labels. 
right? And so what that says effectively is that this is a constant function in, in this box, in each of the boxes. And effectively, the way that you use this formula is you do the following. You say, well, if it's a constant function in the box, I could evaluate it at a different point in the box, and I'd still get the same value. So in particular, I could evaluate it at k label plus k residual. And then I can use that formula up there to say that this is just an integral with a continuous k of the function evaluated at that continuous k. So, so that's the way that sort of number one works. We are integrating functions that are constant in the boxes, and so then it's kind of trivial that we just how to put the boxes back together. Yeah? So this uh, DKR integration doesn't have KR plus? Yeah, so I would, what I mean by it is, okay. yeah, so, each of, so I'm using here for each minus or perp momenta a one-dimensional okay, notation. One dimension. Yeah, and so I have three of these. I have to do this. And for each one of them, it's true that what I'm saying. But of course, if I tried to write that on the board, then it would confuse the point, I think, <laughs> which is a, in some sense a simple point. OK, so this is in some sense saying that this whole split up that we were doing was not really needed. We could have just written a continuous integral, and that's kind of what this is saying, right? That we could have just written a continuous integral and not worried so much about all this split up that we were doing. The place that, that we have to be careful about is these restrictions, and we'll come back to that. And the other place that you have to be careful about is when you have the multipole expansion. But as long as you sort of take care of that, then the basically this is always, is always happening. So the reason why this works is the following. For every label loop momentum that there is in any diagram, there's always going to be some corresponding residual that's not specified by delta functions in terms of external momenta. And effectively, therefore, we can that we can absorb in order to do what we just said. So we can always go back from this discrete type notation back to a continuous notation. The discrete notation was just helping us to set up the expansion and be careful about it. But we can always go back to the continuous one because there's always a KR that has this property that it's. OK. So now, in general, though, you might have some more complicated thing. And if I'm going to give you some rules, I should sort of give you a complete set. So we have to append our, our list of rules by the following one. So if I thought about doing what I just said over here, but I went to some higher order, then what could happen? Well, then these kr minus and kr perps could show up. They'd never show up in the denominator of our propagators if they were just collinear propagators. But they could show up at some point in the numerator. And we need actually a rule like this one, which is, would be clear if we were regulating dkr in, in dimensional regularization, that the power divergences are getting set to 0. And that is, is basically to maintain the, the rent symmetry in the residual space. We need a, a rule like this for j greater than 0. So that only comes in, doesn't come into our calculation, but included for completeness. So when would these integral over kr actually do something non-trivial? It would do something non-trivial if we had ultra-soft loops and collinear loops at the same time. 
in the case where we just have collinear loops, it's basically up to this issue about the restrictions that we'll talk about. It's basically that we just could have done everything as continuous and ignored this, this split. But if we have both ultra soft particles that are sort of participating through the loops, so or and and or, then these will give non trivial. In general, these will give non trivial loop momenta in the residual momenta. And hence, there will be some that we can't just absorb in the fashion that we just said. So there will be, in this situation, residual momenta. Some residual momenta will be absorbed in the same way to turn the integrals into continuous ones, but other ones won't be absorbed. And that's because the ultra soft propagators, right, would involve LR, the LR plus, the LR minus, and the LR perp in the denominator. So we don't have this rule to apply. We can't do what we said here with the constant boxes because now the functions are depending on that variable. So we just have to do the integral. So you could have something that looks like just in kind of a schematic formula. Let's have there be two kr and, a, and an lr. We're in kind of an obvious notation. I'm saying that the function could depend on lr residual. It doesn't depend on kr residual. So we absorb kr back into the sum to make it continuous. And then this integral we just have to do. OK, but it's still. We're still, in the end, just doing an, an integral. So this guy could come from ultra soft propagators, for example. OK, so those are the kind of different cases that you can get. But nevertheless, even if you have ultra soft particles and propagators floating around, there will always be a residual momentum associated to the sort of what we were doing over here that you can absorb in the same way I, I stated. So let's uh, proceed along these lines and see where it takes us. And then we'll come back and put in this additional restrictions. So will you ever have to do a discrete sum? Like, is there a sum over LL right here? Yeah, so you never have to do a discrete sum. Yep. <laughs> the discrete sum is really just a way of thinking. And, and I, I'll show you in a, in a minute that you even can avoid thinking about it once you know what to do. <laughs> so it's guiding you towards the right answer. But it's not really something that you have to th think about this grid picture. It's really just, if you get confused, you can always think about it. But if you're not confused, you don't have to think about it. OK, so this guy is what we said, proportional to what we said. It's just a In this case, the reason why it was so simple is because there was only k, the k residual is one component of this guy. And then there's these other three, right? And for the other three, we just absorb, we absorb the sum and the integral back together. And there's Nothing further to talk about, so that's why this isn't. Some kind of sense very simple. So we just do that. And what do we get? Get some one over epsilons. We get some logs of p squared. constant term, since it's pretty simple, 4 minus pi squared over 6. So this is, we had a loop, we had a, if you remember, think about where this came from. There was a, the place that this Wilson line came from was attaching this guy over here and then integrating out that 
prop that off-shell propagator. So this is a vertex diagram. We had a vertex diagram, which was an ultrasoft gluon, and now we've added an identical type topology, except we drew it different because this line was off-shell. So we drew it as a Wilson line, and that's the right way of thinking about it. But if you think about where it came from, it was the same topology, and we've added another vertex diagram. So the effective theory has two type of vertex diagrams, this collinear one and the ultrasoft one, and we're going to add them together. And in this one, you see the logs are minimized at a different scale, mu squared of order p squared, which is the right scale for a collinear loop. Because remember, the collinear particles lived at a larger p squared than the, the ultrasoft ones. So this is a larger, there's a larger scale that would minimize these loops. It's the collinear scale. So the effective theory is capturing the physics at that scale. Let's squeeze in another diagram here. If we do the collinear wave function renormalization, then this is non-zero. This was zero for the ultrasoft gluon, and, but for the collinear gluon, it's non-zero. And it's exactly actually the same as the full theory. It's the same as massless QCD. So you can do the diagram using the effective theory of Feynman rules, and that's what you find. But you could also understand why that's true. And the reason why it's true is nothing in this diagram really specifies a frame. We, did, we, we called all the particles collinear, but it's not attached to anything. So we could just take the whole diagram and kind of boost back to the frame where everything's kind of soft. And then we would use it, be thinking about it in terms of the full theory field. So there's, uh, yeah, and that's effectively why this diagram, like this, that doesn't have any kind of reference, unlike this one, which has a reference because it's attached to the heavy quark. That's why it's the same as QCD. Did the IFL prescription? Yep. How do you know what the IFL prescription for the Wilson line is? Oh, for this one. Yeah, for this one, um, you, for this guy, it actually doesn't depend on the I epsilon prescription up to a, yeah, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah. That's true, I believe, when I'm being a little bit cavalier with it. But once I put in the zero bin restrictions, I'm not sure if that's true anymore. Like, yeah. I mean, really what solves that is that in a minute, I'm going to be talking about the fact that there's a subtraction term here. And once you put the subtraction term in, that I0 is not relevant. But I think even if you do this diagram with arbitrary I0, Because what's happening is that pole is m bar dot k going to zero is related to some of these one over epsilons. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. It could be that there's some sign that might flip. I'm not 100% sure. That then. Yeah. I, I guess I know that if, yeah. What I know is that, yeah, let me, talk, let me answer your question later. It'll be easier, because I'm trying to say a bunch of things that depend on something else that I haven't explained yet. So. <laughs> so what are the other possible topologies we could write down? So we could write down this one, where we take two attachments in the Wilson line and just loop them back up. But that's proportional n bar squared, and so that's 0 in our Feynman gauge. And likewise, there's kind of a looping back up in the vertex, in the wave function renormalization, but this guy's scaleless, power law divergent. And so we can just set it to zero in dim reg. We don't have to worry about it. OK, so that's all the diagrams. Let's think about doing matching, i.e., let's think about comparing QCD and SCT by adding up the diagrams. <laughs> 
In QCD, we carried out the renormalization. We added the Z for the tensor current. Let me just write again what the answer kind of looked like. In SCT, we didn't carry out renormalization yet. So let me call this the bare SCT result for now. Once we add the ultrasoft and collinear diagrams together, the logs of p squared match up exactly with the full theory. So this is the first sign that we're really that it makes sense to be thinking about adding these loops, even though they're, they're, they were the same topology, we are correctly reproducing those logs of p squared in the full theory. And then there's some other pieces. So you see what they look like. Well, maybe I won't. I won't write the constant. So there's all the effective field theory terms. So these terms here, we can match up with these terms here. So that's good. These terms here, which remember in the full theory were finite, and these terms here, which in the effective theory are finite, the difference of those is going to give the Wilson coefficient. Now, we said that the Wilson coefficient could be a function of p-bar. So what's going on with that? Well, if you look at momentum conservation in this process of beta s gamma, so I probably should have said this earlier. So when you look at beta s gamma, if you look at momentum conservation, then the p minus of the strange quark has to be equal to the p minus of the b quark, but that's just mb. Okay, so. Actually, p minus is equal to mb by kinematics. So mbs in this result here, you shouldn't think of as p minuses, and that's the things that this p bar that was in our Wilson coefficient is just getting set to mb because of some delta functions that are specifying kinematics. So that leaves the kind of one over epsilon terms. And so what we'd like is that those terms are associated to renormalization. of the effective theory, right? I wrote that the effective theory was bare. But if I want to do that, then I have to ensure that all these epsilons that are appearing here are really ultraviolet divergences. If they're infrared divergences, then doing that doesn't make sense. And that's actually the, re the remaining issue that we have to deal with. If I, I just wrote epsilon. That means I'm ignorant to what they are. And if I, I knew this one was epsilon ir because it came from the wave function normalization of the heavy quark, and that was the same on both sides. It was the same diagram as the wave function normalization diagram, the full and the effective theory, so I could match up that one. These ones just came out. But it turns out, that so far, with what we've done, some of these epsilons here are IR. And so the IR divergences aren't matching up. And the reason is because we didn't put in those restrictions on our sum over labels. 
Okay, so we had these restrictions, k label not equal to zero, and k label not equal to minus pl. Those are, the one, those are the restrictions that I'm talking about. The place that those restrictions came from was kl was the k was the momentum of the gluon. kl not equal to zero is saying that the gluon shouldn't be. This is the restriction that the gluon is collinear. Because KL equals zero is the ultrasoft gluon. And this is the restriction that the fermion is collinear in the loop. And that's why there was two of them. So these are called zero bins. Zero because it's the, where the ultrasoft momentum lives, and that's kind of from the point of view of collinear, that's zero. So imposing these restrictions is, is removing the zero bin, if you like. And what these restrictions do is they avoid double, double counting. And the way I've said it, that's, I think, clear. So, so far in our calculation, we haven't avoided double counting, and that's the problem. So we have to modify our rule, or we extend our rule, to, avoid, to include the case where we have these restrictions. So in an extended version of rule two that has restrictions. So really what we want to do is that. And we want to think about that as an integral. So here's how we can manipulate these to think about it as an integral. Let's sum over all KLs. But then we'll subtract the sort of We'll subtract the limit of this f, where we take the f and we, we let the kl go to the, the place. So we integrate over everywhere, including the place we don't want to go, and we subtract the, and then we subtract it back. Um, so what is this fl of k? So this f of kl goes to 0. It's defined by taking the scaling limit of the collinear momenta towards the ultrasoft. So you take your collinear momenta, which are the plus minus and the perp here, and you scale them towards the, an ultrasoft momentum in whatever components, i.e., you start counting the Kn's as quarter lambda squared. And you keep the leading order piece. Or you keep the piece that's the same size as this term. And then that defines what this f is. It's the, once you take that limit and you expand, then that's what the, this f is. Okay. So what you're doing here by doing this procedure is you're basically setting things up so that this guy is integrated over in a way that we can combine back into an integral, but then we have to subtract kind of an overlap of when that integral would go into the ultrasoft region. But the overlap we're subtracting is also an integral. So we have a difference of integrals. And you should think of the second integral as kind of like the square, integrating over the square where the zero bin was. <laughs> 
So if you think about our picture where the cleaners were up here, ultra softs are down here, and you th thought about the, there being some box, you're taking the scaling limit when this guy goes down into that box. You add up all the boxes, that's this, and then you subtract out that box again. And that avoids having a double counting in that region. OK, so then this guy here, you can do the same kind of trick as before. So continuing with the equation, KL is going to 0. We can think of it just as a function of KRs. And so effectively, what we get in the end is an integral over all k of f of k, the full f, evaluated with a continuous momentum, minus some f that's expanded and avoids there being overlap in this box. So rather than having this discrete sum with a restriction, we have a difference of integrals. And this subtraction term avoids the overlap in that region. Okay. So all the discrete sums are good for is a means of figuring out what limits you need to take to generate these subtractions. And once you've done that, everything's a continuous integral. And this is called the zero bin subtraction. OK, so that if you like, one way of phrasing what's going on is that the collinear propagators are really distributions. They're distributions that know that there should be, that they ha should have a subtraction in order to not overlap the other region where we have another degree of freedom. So you could think about it that way, and this, having this sum is just a way of sort of encoding that. But in the end, it kind of looks like some kind of plus function where you have a subtraction. So it seems like in the second term, you, you would have to rewrite the expression because initially in your f of k, you ignored k r. Yeah. And I'll show you how it works in an example I put clear. So let's go to our example. Yeah, it's not, so what you just said is not quite the way you should think about it. You should think about it that you've given the effective theory f. And now I'm saying that that f as given with its momentum as given has a, still has an overlap with the ultra soft region that I want to subtract. So I'm taking a limit of that f. I'm not adding anything back to it. So this guy, integral dk. So this is what we wrote before. And now if I take the ultra soft limit of it, of the k, then I would write this. OK, so when I take the scaling limit, if you think about k squared, it's k plus, k minus, minus k perp squared. When I take the scaling limit of all momentum being ultra soft, the components of the k are still homogeneous. So there's nothing there to expand. Some expansion happened in this k plus p term. 1 over m bar dot k changes its power counting, but uh, it's still m bar dot k, and we don't, there's nothing to expand there. So this is what the subtraction looks like. And in the numerator, the m bar dot k can be dropped relative to the m bar dot p, which is large and external. OK, so this is taking the ultra soft limit of this. Yeah, so in general, I would have to subtract off the ultra soft limit of the quark as well. And when I do that, what I find is a term that's power suppressed. And I, so I drop it. But in general, I would have to do that as well. That's right. Um, and so this is 
you know, it looks kind of like an ultrasoft diagram, except it's got this n bar dot k and instead of the v dot k that we had in the ultrasoft diagram. Um, and if you do a power counting with the loop momentum scaling as ultrasoft, then you, this piece is of order the same size as this piece, and that's why you keep it only that term. You and, no. So the prescription we have is that we drop the higher powers. But if I wanted to do this calculation higher power. Oh, if you did the higher power. Lower power, higher power zero bin? No. So if we did the higher power, then this would start out with higher power. And then when we took the limit of it, it would end up, you know, just starting at that power or higher. Right, but there was a, there was a power. Yeah, you don't have to, you don't have to. No. No? No. Yeah. Yeah, so it's kind of really what you care about subtracting here are the log divergences. And that's what this minimal subtraction is doing. By taking the piece that you're only keeping the piece that's scaling the same way, you're removing the log divergent pieces. And it's the log divergent pieces which are giving our one over epsilons. Um, the pieces that you would get from the higher expansion, you know, they would all be kind of like power law divergent terms from the point of view of the power counting. And we just don't have to worry about those. And, and another way of saying it is, you know, it's not that I'm removing absolutely this whole integrand in that region, right? There could still be a constant, for example, that comes from that region. But if there's a constant that comes from that region, I don't care. What I care about removing is any spurious IR singularities. And for those, I can make a kind of minimal subtraction, which is just the, the first term. All right, so I want to finish this discussion. So if we do this, we get an answer, which is, I will try to write on the board for you. So now I'm going to distinguish all the, the epsilons, and then we'll see what this subtraction does. So if I was careful and I distinguished all the epsilons in our original calculation, it would actually look like this. And then the subtraction piece gives an extra contribution, and it's actually scaleless in, in the n bar dot k here. It, it's, so it's, there's a scaleless loop in this, in this guy. So it, it actually vanishes if the epsilon ir and the epsilon uv are said to be equal. But what it does is it converts the epsilon irs that are in the first expression into epsilon uvs, which is what we want. So once you add up these two things, the epsilon irs are canceling. And the epsilon irs that were coming in the original formula, those were coming about because of this bad behavior as n bar dot k goes kind of into the ultrasoft, into the limit of sort of n bar dot k going small. You can think about that roughly as where the ultrasoft is. This is kind of subtracting off that behavior. And the remainder then is coming from, you know, only having divergences for sort of n bar dot k goes to infinity, which is a sort of proper collinear ultraviolet divergence, not from n bar dot k going to zero. So once you put the two together, the epsilon irs cancel. And then we get exactly actually the same expression we had before, but where all those 1 over epsilons are 1 over epsilon uvs. So, so the epsilon irs come from second term? From both terms. So they both have epsilon irs, but they cancel between them. Okay. Yeah. And the remainder is just epsilon uvs, so all the epsilons that I wrote in my earlier formula would be now epsilon uvs once I take into account the subtraction. So I could have just ignored the subtraction, and that's a lot, often what people do when, if they know that this is that the zero bins are kind of giving a scaleless integral, they say, well, let's ignore the subtraction. We'll just say that all the epsilons are uv. And the zero bin makes them uv. But if we really want to look and see that things are working properly, we should take the subtraction and calculate it and make sure that that's true. But we could have just taken the answer that I wrote down earlier and said those epsilons are ultraviolet, and let's throw them in a counter term and calculate it in almost dimension. And that is indeed, so we'll, go, we'll proceed that way next time, but we now know that actually they are ultraviolet divergences. So next time we'll take that, that count the ultraviolet divergences and we'll define from them a counter term and we'll see how we get an anomalous dimension and what kind of logs we sum by using that anomalous dimension. <laughs>
So the zero bin that, that's scaleless in this particular example is not always scaleless. So sometimes it could give a non depends on the problem you're dealing with. So if you're sometimes you can set things up so that it's scaleless and then you just basically can ignore it. But that's not always true, so you do have to think about whether it's really going to be true for what you're doing. If it is true, then you can ignore then you could effectively ignore it because it's sort of just making the physics come out right, making sure there's no overlap, but if your regulator is set up so that it's scaleless, you can kind of just get around it. But in general, that might not be true. If you had more scales in the problem, if you're doing some calculation that had some jets of finite size, then, then it won't be true, typically.